So welcome to the Fat of the Land. I'm Nicolette Han Nyman. I'll be the, the moderator today. And I am incredibly happy to be part of this conference, which truly has been um, a very unique gathering, unlike any that I've ever attended. And I hope and I believe it will actually uh, mark a turning point in the public conversation in the United States about food because there have been some really important ideas presented here and it will continue to be over the next couple of days that, that are really not part of the conversation that much right now in the American you know, sort of good food movement. And actually this fat issue to me is, is kind of a, a perfect um, example of the type of issue that I think is uh, is not getting adequate treatment in the public conversation and in the advocacy work that's happening in the United States today. In fact, so much so, I would, my feeling is it's kind of off in, in the very um, unproductive direction right now. It was incre intriguing to me, for example, that this morning in the plenary sessions, every time the word fat was mentioned, it was negative. <laughs> I assume several of you noticed that, and it was often like sugars and fats. And it, okay, sugar and fat together, agreed, bad. But is fat equivalent to sugar as far as dietary problems? I don't think so. In fact, I would argue just the opposite. So this is some of what we're going to be talking about today. But we have um, an incredible collection of people uh, that are going to be presenting their work and their experiences, and I think we will have... I hope um, it's really going to challenge some of the orthodoxies that people in the United States are generally holding about the issue of fats and how it's produced and what that means for both the environment and human health. Now this is such a big topic that we realized uh, we couldn't cover everything. And so what we decided to do is focus on the shift. So the shift in the American diet. Uh, away from animal fats and towards vegetable fats and vegetable oils, hydrogenated vegetable oil and, and liquid vegetable oils, and talk about sort of what that has meant and what, what that maybe should cause us to re-examine as far as all of the questions surrounding what we eat and what the implications are of the food that's being produced in the United States. So we have a really interesting and diverse panel that's going to look at this, and we're not going to be able to delve deeply into every type of fat. So what we decided to do was to delve deeply into one particular type of um, vegetable oil fat that is replacing um, animal fats in a lot of contexts, and that's palm oil. So um, I just want to quickly say, uh, and then we're going to hopefully have lots of time for discussion at the end because uh, the panelists and I all feel that that's going to be a very productive part of this. Um, I, I just want to quickly say that um, my own experience, I think, with the whole fats question sort of uh, tracks, I think, a lot of Americans thinking about this. I remember very well uh, as a child when my parents decided, you know, we shouldn't really have butter in the house, we shouldn't really have whole milk in the house, it should be skim milk, it should be margarine. And my parents were extremely health conscious. You know, my mother had a large garden. She cooked everything from scratch. She baked her own bread. She made her own yogurt. Um, we were very focused on healthful eating and eating whole, real foods. But uh, my parents fully accepted the idea because this was so clearly stated over and over again that fat, and especially animal fat, was, was bad for your health. And so we began to pretty much take that out of our diet. And, and by the time I reached college, that to me was sort of an absolute fact. I knew that animal fat was bad for your health. And so when I began to be focused on the environmental consequences of mainstream meat production, I concluded that becoming a vegetarian would be the best choice because I felt it was the most responsible thing environmentally, and it was also obviously better for my health because I would be eliminating most animal fats or a lot of animal fats. Well, a lot of time has passed um, over the last couple of decades since, since that was, you know, first became the absolute established wisdom about what we should be doing as far as uh, food that we're eating and, and food that we're producing. And my own view on it has changed a great deal. And I think this has happened uh, for a lot of people that have been looking more closely at the evidence supporting the conclusion that um, animal fat is bad for our health. And so what we're going to do today is examine some of this history and some of the consequences of that shift from the animal fats 
to more vegetable fats, vegetable oils. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to begin with Libby Burnick, who's the Senior Vice President of North America at True Cost, and she's going to present specifically um, about their research related to the cost of um, the production, the sort of externalized cost of, um, of palm oil. And um, that will be followed immediately by Cynthia Ong, who's the founder of LEAP, which is the Land Empowerment Animals and People Organization. And she's going to give us some firsthand uh, experiences in her work um, on the palm oil question. And then we're going to move on uh, to Nina Teicholz, who's a journalist and author of, of, a, of a book that truly has rattled uh, many, many cages um, about just sort of um, challenging this whole question of the acceptance of saturated fat in general, and especially saturated fat and animal fat being bad for human health. And then uh, Richard Young is going to speak and sort of tie a lot of these things together. And, um, and we will um, open it up for questions at the end, and um, I'm sure we'll have... Oh, I'm so sorry. My God, her work is absolutely essential. <laughs> She's in the back. It's because you're standing in the back of the room. You weren't right in my eye line. And Cynthia Daly is going to, she's done amazing work. In fact, in my book, Defending Beef, I have a lot of um, her data. Um, so I'm very familiar and love it. It's incredible data. Looking at this question of grass-based production for, uh, for specifically uh, cattle products, meat and dairy especially, and looking at whether these, this, these are nutritionally significant. Because uh, one of the things that I learned in writing my own uh, book, Defending Beef, a few years ago, when I started really looking at the data, first of all, I was shocked that there was um, such, a, such a transition away from animal fats towards vegetable fats, because I was still under the impression that Americans were eating a lot more uh, animal fat than ever. <laughs> and it turns out that that's actually not true at all. Um, but I was also, um, it became really clear to me that all of the research that has been done to date on, uh, on meat and health implications and fat and health implications has not made any distinction between the way the animals are raised and whether they're on grass or pasture or not, and whether, or whether they're in total confinement systems, which increasingly that appears to be an absolutely essential distinction. So let's start with Libby Bernick. I, I know we're going to have a really interesting conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's uh, wonderful to be here, and I'll start this story with a discussion about the environmental costs of palm oil production, which we thought was perhaps benign, but not nearly so. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the company I work for, True Cost, we're a London-based research firm, and for the last 15 years, we've been working with businesses and investors to help them understand and then value in, in monetary terms the economic consequences of our business models. And our aim in doing this is really to direct capital and investment towards more sustainable business models by putting a value, a monetary value, on these externalities. So we, we work across all industry sectors at True Cost, but given the extraordinary impacts and dependencies that agriculture has with the natural world, we do a lot of work uh, with food and beverage systems and full cost accounting of what we call soft commodities and in particular palm oil. So palm oil is a very interesting story because there's been enormous growth in the industry that's been rapid and large over just the last 25 years because the notion that this is perhaps a healthier uh, fat or, or oil. So in the early 1990s, the palm oil industry was largely localized. It was a small industry in Southeast Asia and it's now grown over 43%. It's a $50 billion crop. About 75% of what is grown in Southeast Asia is exported to Europe, Africa, and to some extent, the United States. And are any of you familiar with how palm oil is, is grown on plantations? A few of you? So for those of you do, who don't know, palm oil is grown in plantations in what used to be uh, large areas of rainforest. So these rainforests are cleared, and what happens in the course of that is that 
uh, carbon is released. So Indonesia, where much of the palm oil is grown, about 66% of our palm oil comes from Indonesia. Indonesia is now the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind the United States and China, largely as a result of this clearing of the rainforest. What also happens during that clearing is that peat from the soil is taken up and burned, which creates enormous air quality problems. And in fact, in many of the, the intense growing times and clearing times of the year, these forest fires that are created generate huge swaths of air pollution and smog such that in Singapore, there's health incidents and crises because of the air pollution. So for those of you who are not familiar, like I am with Southeast Asian geography, that would be like burning a peatland at, in San Diego and then feeling the effects up in Sacramento. That's the kind of distance that we're talking about and the kind of impacts that we're seeing. So because of these environmental issues associated with palm oil, uh, organizations have started to ask and wanted to account for what these costs, these environmental and social costs really are. So about three years ago, we began working with uh, Brazil, who was looking to develop their palm oil production in a more responsible way and to learn what had been done in Indonesia to see if they could build their industry. So we did some very site-specific farm-level work uh, in Brazil with Conservation International and the Brazilian company Natura to look at the true cost of palm oil production. We went from that very site and farm level then to working with Teeb, whose leadership you heard about earlier today, where Teeb stepped in and wanted to know what are the true costs of palm oil production globally, the entire industry, and started asking the hard questions about how do we start to put a monetary value on some of these environmental and social costs. So what the questions led to then was this sector-wide study looking at uh, palm oil production in 11 different countries, the major growing regions around the world, along with a very detailed analysis of palm oil production in Indonesia looking and looking at different alternative growing methods. And Indonesia, of course, is where the largest production occurs. So we looked at a wide range of environmental costs, looking at greenhouse gas emissions, water use, the types of fertilizer, whether it was organic or synthetic, and then also two social metrics associated with uh, fair wage and also uh, accidental uh, um, health and safety of, of the workers. So when we added up all of these costs for the entire palm oil industry, it turns out, not surprisingly, they are quite significant. They add up to about $43 billion in societal costs from these environmental impacts that these communities are now paying for. So $43 billion, I mean, to me, that, that sounds big, but let's put it in context. $43 billion in environmental costs that society is paying for, the total production value of palm oil is $50 billion. So the environmental costs are almost equal to the total production value of palm oil. So if you put it in other words, if the industry had to pay for the cost, these environmental costs of production, the price of palm oil would almost double. So I wanna caution you, of course, these numbers are very dependent on region, so there's a threefold difference depending on whether you're looking at Brazil or whether you're looking at Indonesia, so these costs do vary significantly by location, but no matter how you look at it, uh, these costs are quite significant and large. Now, are they as large as other commodities? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we look at beef, for example, the commodity cost of beef is about $35,000 per ton, so of course beef production has much higher external costs, and the cost of beef production uh, is about one and a half times its market value. 
So palm oil has significant costs, uh, especially in relation to uh, its production value. So I've just given you a very high level summary of this very detailed research report, which of course is available online to any of you who like to delve into the details and get into more of the information about what exactly these costs are. But I hope I've set the stage for the conversation about showing that this current business model for palm oil production is absolutely not sustainable uh, in the long term and that what we thought was a healthy oil perhaps has very unintended consequences for the environment. So obviously when we talk about true cost accounting and putting things into much more systemic perspective and connecting the dots, um, part of what we need to think about is those quantifiable um, questions and uh, whether they're public health costs or environmental costs, um, it's very good to have those numbers. I always like to think and remember um, in addition to that, that there are many things that are very difficult or even impossible to quantify. And to me, as someone who's been living on the land um, for the last, you know, 13 years, uh, that's very real to me. The difference in the, the, the uh, a well-run pasture-based farm versus a large confinement operation or feedlot is dramatic um, for that community, for the animals, and for the people that are running it. So there are lots of different kinds of costs, and um, the quantifiable ones are only part of it, but it's very good to, to have some numbers and, and realize that some of this can be quantified, and these are very, very uh, significant numbers when we add it up, especially that was really shocking to hear the difference <laughs> between the total value of the crop and the externalized cost. So the next person that we're going to hear from, I think, is going to really add a lot of texture to this palm oil issue is Cynthia Ong. So please come up. going to need the help of these images to help uh, ground a little bit and give some visuals to what Libby was saying earlier. Um, here we are. Can you guys see? So I'm going to take you, so there we are on the left over there in San Francisco, and we're going to take you to Southeast Asia, which is ground zero for palm oil production, about 90% of palm oil comes from this part of the world, which is also where I'm from. Um, so this is the state of Sabah, where in one frame, just about anywhere you go, you will see both pristine forests and oil palm. So in fact, I, I remembering the conversation with Patrick when, we, when the, the fat of the land um, idea came to you. Do you remember? You were talking about um, your, your uh, um, animals on your farm and then I was talking about palm oil and he said, wait a minute, we're living off the fat of your land. <laughs> and that's actually where the, this title came from. So uh, just to ground Libby's, Libby's report earlier, this, I just came from here um, last week and I was grappling with all of these issues and this is a, an elephant trapped in a smallholder plantation. And this is happening every day, more and more um, as migration routes are disrupted, um, you know, and elephants who used to walk a particular path to food now bump into all palm plantations. Um, so, and, and you know, this is increasingly the pattern. This is not a departure uh, at all. Um, what, is the, what, what, is, what is the cost of this? Um, I don't know if you can quantify it really. Um, polluted rivers from runoff, sedimentation, from opening up of land. Um, you know, this is again like a, a daily occurrence where, where I live. Um, and this mass fish death, uh, again I just came from this situation where palm oil mill effluent that runs out of every mill flows into rivers and um, you know, the, what the, the impact is is, um, you know, basically fish cannot survive in this kind of 
um, um, atmosphere. Uh, and haze. This was what it was like when I left. Um, and as you were saying earlier, this is all over the region in Southeast Asia. I don't know how we quantify that. That's health, um, you know, way into those children's future. Um, so what are we doing in Sabah is we're drawing a line. We're using the, the round table on sustainable palm oil standards. Although people say it's not high enough or whatever, for us, it's a, it's a way to coalesce government, civil society, industry, indigenous communities around a set of principles and criteria to just get on track um, and start changing our practices on the ground. Because as it is, as you saw, it's not acceptable. And this is only getting more and more uh, the case, not less and less. Uh, so we, uh, Greenpeace says um, our SPO is not high enough. We say we just have to use anything we have um, by which to organize. Um, uh, this is the poster child for palm oil devastation. And it, it's both sensationalized as well as true. Um, their habitats are being devastated every day uh, as we speak. And I'd like to say that, you know, these guys and restoring their respectable place within the, the web is intimately linked to whether that other guy survives. Um, and this little girl and what she eats and her health and her future, I would say, is also connected. Um, <coughs> conscious consumption impacting the demand on this side of the world has an immediate impact on outside of the world. And um, this image, Pavan Sukhdev actually showed this a couple of years ago at a conference in Jakarta. And he said, what do you think this is? What do you guys think it is? This is precipitation in the atmosphere coming from equatorial rainforest regions of the planet. So this is the ecosystem services that rainforests provide for the entire planet. And if you turn this off, um, I, I can't even imagine what the, how you would quantify that for the planet. Um, on that note, I will end. <laughs> Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, we won't be able to delve into all of the fats, but it's, and oils, that are replacing the, the disappeared animal fats from our diet. But um, I think having one very vivid example of how the shift has been happening and what it's meant um, out of our sight is extremely helpful. So thank you so much. So our next speaker is gonna be Nina Teichholz. She has written one of the best, most widely read books uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years in the United States. Wall Street Journal said it was one of the best books of the year last year. And um, it, has, it makes the case that we have got this fats issue totally wrong. <laughs> so um, she has a very big challenge to try to summarize that all in just 15 minutes. But we're going to go ahead and let her try. <laughs> all right. Nina, I can do it. Thank you, Nicolette. Um, and I have a presentation. While I'm pulling this up, I just want to, it was wonderful to hear your story about the journey that you've taken. It reminds me of mine. I feel like there's almost not a woman our age who like didn't go through the low fat, non fat period where she was counting all the calories in her toothpaste, you know, because we were all so obsessed about fat. And I, you know, also spent 20 years not eating cheese, eggs, butter, red meat for 20 years. And so it wasn't until I, um, dive, dove into the research that it really, I realized that the story was just so very, very different. So I'm going to take you on a little tour of my research and what I found, and then we'll wind up at palm oil at the end, so you'll see how it's relevant. But, um, so just to start right off, um, this is our change in fat consumption in the United States. We, um, 
uh, dramatically reduced animal fat consumption. This is uh, over the course of the, t that's the 20th century. And we've replaced our animal fats with um, vegetable oils, basically, plant-based fats. Um, so it's a huge change. Actually, the increase in vegetable oils is the single biggest increase in any food product over the course of the last 100 years. So it's been a radical transformation. This is a little bit more breaking it down. You can see um, the blue line, butter went down, green is lard going down, um, beef tallow has been lower. But you know, before 1900, the major, the major cooking fats for Americans and all people indeed were butter and lard. So um, vegetable oils really weren't, didn't enter into the food supply until the early 1900s. And you can see, um, so yellow is margarine going up and then shortening before 1936, that was mainly lard, and then after 1936, that was mainly um, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. And here's just one to show it's mainly soybean oil that we're consuming now. Huge, huge increases in soybean oil. All right, why did this happen? Um, well, the main reason is that we switched, so this is just to show the animal fats over to vegetable oils and margarine. That's the big shift that's happened. Um, why do we do that? Well, there's, um, part of it is that these became, after these were invented, they were cheaper. And eventually we switched over, like margin became cheaper than butter and vegetable oil became very cheap. But we also switched over for a big reason, which is that we were told to switch to um, and away from saturated fats. Why did we do that? Well, I'm gonna greatly abridge this story. It's a completely fascinating story and I urge you to read it. You know, if not in my book, there are other stories people have, uh, who have written about it. It all starts in the 1950s when the nation is in a complete panic about the rising tide of heart disease, which had come pretty much from out of nowhere, as you can see. Very few cases of heart disease become the nation's number one killer. And President Eisenhower himself had a heart attack in 1955, was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. So everybody is in a complete panic about what causes heart disease. And it was considered the number one public health emergency. And there were a number of theories about what caused heart disease. So people thought it might be vitamin deficiency, auto exhaust, stress, type A personalities. But there was one um, theory that was proposed by um, a University of Minnesota pathologist named Ansel Keys. And he said it was saturated fat and dietary cholesterol that caused heart attack. They would raise the total cholesterol in your blood and clog your arteries and give you a heart attack. That was called the diet heart hypothesis. Um, and he was um, really the most influential nutrition scientist of the entire, of the last hundred years. He, he, that theory was a theory that was adopted um, and it got him on the cover of Time Magazine and it was adopted in, starting in 1961 by the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association, in 19, that's the first ever advice to cut back on saturated fat and dietary cholesterol in order to avoid a heart attack. That's, um, and that's sort of like the tiny acorn of advice that grew into the giant oak tree of, of advice that we now have. And it was followed by the US um, government in 1980 with the USDA dietary guidelines, which told us to restrict meat and cheese and butter and, and all saturated fats. Um, so um, at the time that these recommendations, that the American Heart Association came out with these recommendations, there, was, there had actually never been a clinical trial on his hypothesis. Um, a clinical trial is the kind of evidence that you need to show cause and effect. You can't, it's just, it's the most rigorous kind of evidence and you, um, Otherwise, the other kind of evidence that you have only shows associations and not, cannot establish causation. So after the American Heart Association came out with this recommendation, there was a tremendous effort to try to prove that that was right. There were multiple large government-funded clinical trials. Um, and on all together, this is a very low ball effort. I think um, it depends on how you characterize them. But on at least 10,000 people, which is a huge number of people to experiment on, in many different clinical trials lasting one to 12 years, and they could not establish, actually, that saturated fats caused heart disease. They couldn't show an effect on cardiovascular mortality. And those clinical trials were basically all um, ignored. <laughs> It's almost impossible to believe, but you know, just, I don't know if anybody who's been reading the newspaper this week knows there was a study that came out in the British Medical Journal where they went back and they looked at one of, actually the biggest of these clinical trials called the Minnesota Coronary Survey, um, 
where on, it was a, an amazing experiment that took place in hospitals where they control what people eat, so it's highly controlled. It's a far better kind of experiment than most of what's done is where they just give you a diet book and say, you know, maybe an hour of counseling. And it was on, um, this experiment was on 9,000 men and women, and at the end of that, they showed no effect, uh, they couldn't find an effect of saturated fat on heart disease. And the, the people who ran that study, who included Ansel Keys, sat on those results and didn't publish them for 16 years. And when he was asked why, much later, he said, well, we were just so disappointed in the way they turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, I mean, that's amazing, and it's also scientific fraud. So this, um, so, just this, so this, what's this headline in the British Medical Journal just this week is people who from the, from the NIH who went back and re, dug up that data and looked at the original data and, and, and they didn't actually add much to the original publication, but they just brought the whole subject back to light to show, look, there's this clinical trial, an incredibly important NIH-funded clinical trial that has gone ignored. And there are, um, that I know of, at least six other major clinical trials that have also been ignored. Um, and uh, if you want to know why, that has to do with politics, and um, it's a very interesting subject that I cannot go into now at length. But so, um, so this disproves Ansel Key's hypothesis. It turns out that if you switch from saturated fats to polyunsaturated vegetable oils, you can lower your total cholesterol. But lowering your cholesterol, your total cholesterol, just does not have an impact on whether or not you have a heart attack. It turns out that total cholesterol is not a very good risk, it's not a good marker of your heart attack risk. So um, in the last five years, there's this, in addition to this British Medical Journal paper this past week, there's actually been a total of 14 meta-analyses and systematic reviews. These are rigorous attempts to go back and try to look at all the data on saturated fats. And they have, um, just in the last five years they've done this, and they've included that saturated fats are not associated with heart disease, which means that that reflects the epidemiological evidence, and they have no effect on cardiovascular mortality, um, except for one review that found um, by the uh, scientific advisor for Unilever, um, that you have no effect on cardiovascular mortality. So that's the state of the science. It just hasn't been recognized by our public health authorities yet. Um, so, and I'm, you know, what had been, what I wanted to kind of technical word externalities, but you know, what have been the unintended consequences from switching from saturated to unsaturated fats? One of the, so we have to remember, vegetable oils were invented in the early 1900s. They're an industrial product. They use chemical solvents, a multi-step process involving winterization, deodorization. Um, there's, it's, it's a giant plant that require, that you need to make a vegetable oil. They, they don't occur naturally in nature. Um, and they, they weren't really much tested before they came into our food supply. When they did those, find those big clinical trials, uh, this is another one called the LA Veterans Study, they consistently found that the people who were on the high polyunsaturated vegetable oil diets um, had higher rates of cancer. Um, in fact, they were so worried about it, there was a series of high-level meetings at the NIH in the early 1980s to try to reckon with these results, and they, um, they couldn't figure it out, and nobody's figured that out. But higher rates of cancer, not just associated with, caused by eating higher rates of vegetable oils. So that's one external externality. Um, another is that vegetable oils are highly unstable. They, an oil is um, a polyunsaturated fat. Poly means it has many double bonds. Each one of those double bonds is a chance to react with oxygen. Um, and that's always been true of oils. They go rancid easily, as you know, they can go bad. And, they, um, and so they lead to, um, they get oxidized and they cause inflammation. And um, this is the cover of the, this is not like some popular magazine. This is, the, this is the magazine of the American Oil Chemist Society, which is the premier group of oil chemists, lipidologists. Um, and, they, and toxic aldehydes is just one of the oxidation products, toxic oxidations that's, that's created by vegetable oils, when, especially when heated. So, you know, all those vegetable oil, the fryers, your french fries, all the fried food in restaurants, is um, contaminated by these toxic oxidation products. 
Um, what are the externalities also of swapping animal foods for plant foods? Because you remember when we were told to you know, get rid of um, fat out of the diet, we were told to eat all of what's in the big bottom slab of the USDA food pyramid, which is more grains, rice, pasta. Um, so what are the externalities of that? Uh, this is just to show you we did as we were told. This is to show you know, one of the things we're often told, Americans don't follow the guidelines, in fact we did. Um, fat is way down. And just to remember, there's only three kind of macronutrients to eat. There's fat, protein, and carbohydrate. Our protein has stayed constant. But we've brought our fat way down, and that means our carbohydrates have gone way up. Grains are up by 41%. Wheat is up by 21%. Fruit is up by 13%. All carbohydrates. Um, what's wrong with carbohydrates? Well, the, the theory is, and... Um, this is a theory now supported by quite a lot of good clinical trial data. When you eat any carbohydrate, it's converted in your body into glucose. Even those healthier whole grains become glucose in your bloodstream. Glucose triggers the release of, in of uh, insulin from your pancreas. Insulin is like the king of all hormones for making you fat. You cannot get fat, you cannot depose fat without the presence of insulin. Insulin plus glucose. So this is a, a theory, it's, an, it's, a, the, it's a growing a hypothesis with a growing amount of clinical trial data behind it. Um, and this is just to show that by switching, this is one of the pieces of information that support this theory, which is that when we started the USDA dietary guidelines telling us to start eating more, less fat and more carbohydrates, that's the beginning of the obesity epidemic in the United States. So this is just a correlation, it's not causation, it's not proof, but this is a highly suggestive correlation, that we drastically changed our food consumption in the United States and that was the result. Um, also, chronic exposure to insulin over time in your bloodstream, like that means you know, if you have cereal for breakfast, a fruit snack in the middle of the morning, and then you have a sandwich, and then you have another fruit snack, Chronic exposure to insulin over the course of a day, a lifetime, is what leads to type 2 diabetes. So, um, the other things that are worsened by uh, having excessive carbohydrate consumption are most of your heart disease risk factors. Your HDL consistently on high carb diets, your HDL drops, your triglycerides um, rise, and um, LDL cholesterol, it turns out it's, it's a complicated story, but the worst kind of your LDL also rises, your small, called your small dense LDL. Um, so potentially, the negative consequences of switching to a vegetable oil-based high carbohydrate diet are all of the major chronic diseases that are now so burdensome to our society. I mean, I can't even put a number on this, but I, it's just, it's, and we all know how horrible it is, and it's, it's a tremendous toll on people's lives, it's a toll on the economy, it's a toll on our military, you know, we don't have enough people to be in the military, it's just, it's a tremendous externality that we are dealing with on this diet. Um, how am I doing for time? One, One minute. minute. Oh, that's perfect. So, why are animal fats needed? Um, animal fats are needed to eat a higher fat diet. It turns out the low fat, high carb diet is not tolerable for most people. That's why over Ameri half of American is overweight, obese, or, or pre, uh, you know, pre-diabetic or diabetic. If you're to eat a higher fat diet, where do fats occur naturally? Natural fats are in animal foods. So returning to animal foods, bringing those into your diet are the natural whole food way to have a higher fat diet. That's one of the reasons that we need to embrace animal fats again, I believe. Um, the other thing is just returning to the palm oil story. I wanted to show you this. Palm oil, so palm oil is kind of low here. Um, why did palm oil go, get so high? Palm oil, what came, look what came down. Margarine came down. This is also, this is partially hydrogenated olive, uh, oil, right? So what happened? So in order to have a packaged good, anything that sits on a shelf, any manufactured food needs a hard fat, right? You can't use vegetable oils in their oil form. It's greasy, it doesn't have no, any shelf life, it's not long lasting, it goes rancid, so you need to have a hard fat. 
Back here, we were using lard and tallow as our hard fats. McDonald's french fries used to be fried in lard. When we got rid of saturated fats, because we thought they were unhealthy, we had to move to, what did we all move to? We moved to partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, which is hardened oils. That's what Crisco is. That makes them stable and it makes them hard. It mimics a hard fat. But then we just found out that those contain trans fats. This is when we discovered they contain trans fats. Boom, that goes down. We can't use partially hydrogenated vegetables anymore. So what goes up? Palm oil. Palm oil is a plant-based saturated fat. So we had to increase palm oil. There's nothing else for the entire manufacturing industry to use because we can't go back to butter and lard and tallow. Those things are like have such a taboo around them. But if we could, if we found that those fats are no longer bad for health, that would, I think, take the pressure off of palm oil. So that wraps that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Now, um, it, it's possible that in this room, everything Nina just said is not that controversial. <laughs> But out in the greater sort of food world, this is extremely controversial, in spite of the fact that she's backed by very good data. And for any of you that haven't sort of followed this conversation closely, I strongly urge you to look for the article by the British journalist Ian Leslie that came out a couple of weeks ago, where he describes this whole discussion about this whole history of what's happened where we sort of blamed saturated fats starting around mid 20th century and began shifting away, even though even at that time, there were people like um, Dr. John Yudkin in the UK who were saying it's, there isn't good evidence for that and actually sugar is a much more likely culprit for those same problems. Um, so he, he does a brilliant job and actually Nina's work is very prominently featured in that article. I strongly recommend you reading that as well. The Guardian, yeah, did I not say that, sorry. So the other question that's very, very intriguing in all of this is can you treat all uh, animal-based food products, all, all meat and all butter and all cheese the same way? Well, it's sort of, if any one of you have been, and I'm sure many of you have, <laughs> to a confinement dairy operation or a large cattle feedlot, and then you've been to a grass-based dairy, or you've been to a pasture-based uh, uh, or a rangeland-based uh, beef production place, you'll see you know, just radical differences, right? Just inherently you know that in your gut. But there's no distinction made in the research, pretty much none. And so what's really interesting is, is this a large part of the story that has been totally untold and basically almost unexplored? So this is where our next speaker comes in. Um, Dr. Cindy Daly has done amazing work. She's a professor at Cal State at Chico. And um, she's really one of the leading uh, researchers who's showing that this distinction is incredibly important. Well, thank you very much. Nicolette, and uh, I have to say, I was trying to be incognito there in the back of the room because frankly, I got the memo. <laughs> I'm blue on black today, too, and so is <laughs> and so is Good job. Good job. Yeah. So, I think um, I bring the good news today. Uh, I knew this was going to be a very powerful panel, just based on the, the email exchange that preceded um, today's conference. So, uh, my challenge is to get my message across in six minutes or less. <laughs> so, uh, full screen monitor, and we're good. Good. All right. The good news is that um, I think we can do it a little more environmentally friendly. I think we can do animal fats in a way that doesn't cost us that one and a half times the net. That's crazy. Those numbers are horrendous. So the point is, you know, milk isn't milk, and meat is not necessarily meat. And uh, I've uh, invested almost uh, 12 years um, looking at um, this, this paradigm and trying to determine just how um, we can um, delve into a more ecologically friendly way of farming, particularly where livestock are concerned. 
So um, a lot of producers that I work with, I come from a farming background, I work with a lot of producers, um, they were very excited about you know, this grass-based system. We know ecologically it's a much more friendly scenario. So what about you know, the marketability? What is the outcome? What does the product look like? And uh, we took some time. We did uh, a lot of review work. Um, several graduate students and some friends of mine from the Extension Service, we got together and we jumped into the literature. And so we looked at the last 30 years of, uh, of literature in the grass-fed arena, and we found that um, you know, there's an awful lot of interesting uh, data that would suggest that uh, meat is not meat, and that uh, fat is really where it's at. And uh, I kind of show it to you in this kind of uh, graph. Um, overall, we didn't really see any big difference in overall saturated fatty acids. And now that I've listened to the panel today, and I'm going to have to read your book. You know, that looks really good. Um, you know, the, that hypothesis is dead. But even so, um, the saturated fat content in a grass-fed animal that's actually finished off grass is significantly different um, in terms of its individual profile of saturated fatty acids. And those individuals, the C18, the C16, you know, the C18 is um, neutral where the low-density lipoproteins are concerned. And when, as we get down to the shorter chain saturates, that's where we see the, the reductionist science show that there's an elevation in what we would classify as bad cholesterol. But I think those are all outdated terms now based on what I'm hearing. Um, so um, I'll change up my presentation. <laughs> Awesome. You know, we don't know what we don't know until we know it, right? <laughs> meta yeah. So we looked at the omega-6 in our meta-analysis. We basically looked at meat. We looked at the same cut of meat. And uh, what we saw was a significantly higher amount of omega-3. And so that would skew the ratio. Ultimately, the omega-6 level was not different. We just had more omega-3. And so what that meant was that there was a much more beneficial, from a nutritional perspective, a much more beneficial ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. So that was pretty exciting. And then, you know, so if that's the case, really what happens in the beef industry and where we're getting that one and a half times environmental cost is that we put livestock, we put our cattle into a feedlot and we feed them grain. And we do that because it's very efficient. I mean, it produces a lot of beef very quickly. And I think we've you know, seen that there's some environmental costs there um, that are really problematic. It may look efficient on, uh, you know, in the retail store, but you know, from an ecological perspective, we've got some serious um, issues there. So what happens to the animals when we put them in the feedlot? Well, within three months on grain, we drop the nutritional value of that animal significantly. So the lipids remodel, and it may not necessarily be a lipid remodel where the pool of lipids in the body is remodeling, but there's an accumulation of lipid, and it's not the good kind. You know, it's the bad kind. And so we tend to see more, um, less omega-3 um, uptake in those animals, and we're losing that omega-3 in that process. And we know how important omega-3 is. I mean, I think the consumer has that well in hand. Um, We've, we certainly have had a, a much better omega-3, 6 to 3 ratio, you know, um, you know, historically. It hasn't been until, you know, the 50s when that dietary shift had changed. And the other good news um, that I bring is really this whole issue on CLA, and you probably have heard about conjugating little lake acid. But you may not have heard about transvencinic acid, which is another um, unsaturated fatty acid. That is really uh, CLA waiting to happen. So TVA is CLA in waiting. And when you look at the grass-fed cattle, they're significantly higher in TVA. And so we have the potential to endogenously transform our TVA into CLA, which is pretty exciting news. And CLA is pretty well established as being a very, very potent antioxidant. You know, it's basically been uh, established by the National Academy of Sciences that CLA is unequivocally um, been shown to uh, inhibit carcinogenesis in experimental animals. And for the National Academy of Sciences to agree on anything is pretty amazing. So I, I think that's really strong evidence. And there are other types of studies that I really can't delve into because I'm already almost over time. We do have a website where we try to assist producers that are looking at going with this value-added production paradigm to make it a little easier for them to get through the hoops 
that is uh, needed in order to label your product you know, as a grass-fed product. And having gone through this recently with uh, milk labels, it's interesting. And something from a policy perspective that we really ought to get our arms around, I think, pretty suddenly. If we really want to see this take off, if we really want, want to see this movement um, do something significant, we're going to have to help producers navigate uh, the, the policy issues, the approvals, the CDFA issues. They're significant. Um, because of the, uh, the results that we had with our own beef study and with the meta-analysis that we conducted, we got into the dairy thing, and we started to look at the uh, milk issues. And we saw the same exact uh, phenomenon in milk. Um, the full-fat milk is really where you, you have the luscious goodness. That's where the omega-3 is located. That's where your CLA, your TVA, your uh, vitamin A, your vitamin E. It's, it's really amazing stuff, and I'm going to close with, now that's an egg. <laughs> You can definitely tell that's a pasture-based egg because it is orange, and, and it stands up. That albumin, it stands up. That's a much better nutritional package because of all the added nutrients. So, you know, that's where it's at, folks. Thank you. I, I looked at uh, a lot of Cindy's work when I was writing Defending Beef, and I was astonished to see how pronounced these values are. And you wonder, and this is sort of connecting the dots again, well, why, you know, why isn't there more research in this? Well, this goes back to, especially in the United States, the, the research in you know, agriculture and nutrition and health is so tied to industry. And this is not the way, you know, the tiny percentage of animals are raised this way in the United States today. So not only can you not get the funding for it, um, but in some cases, if you try to write or speak or research about it, you can suffer, your academic career can suffer. And I've talked to many researchers over the years who've had that kind of issue happen. So I think we have to, um, again, sort of connecting all these dots, we have to understand that the fact that there isn't a lot of research on this doesn't mean that the research is strong and credible. Um, we have to understand how research is funded and why some research doesn't happen. So I'm incredibly grateful for this research because it, it's very, very helpful for those of us that are trying to you know, make this argument that not all animal products are equal from an environmental or a human health side. In fact, they're radically different depending on how they're raised. So to help us tie all these issues together, we have the absolutely brilliant Richard Young from Sustainable Food Trust. And, I, and he was maybe not going to come to the conference, and I was so disappointed because in the conversations we had leading up to this, I was like, this man is a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> and so we have the walking encyclopedia here, and he's going to tie this all together. And please come up, Richard, and tie this all together. <laughs> Close this window. I'm not, I'm not very familiar with this. Do you need some assistance? Is there? Oh, I've got to close this one so I can get my phone. My smart. Um, see. is there a tech person in the room? No, sorry. It's, 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 I just can't seem to get it on there. It's just not. Just close that for me. Oh. Okay, well, it's only just occurred to me actually that I'm, I'm what you might call the token man on this in this session. <laughs> well, that, that's Where actually a sort of a, a sign of just how how much things are changing, not just at this conference, but I think in the world. And it's also significant because like Nina and uh, Nicolette and many others, I've been interested in this issue for many years. And none of the panels that actually told us back in the 1980s in the US or in the UK actually contained any women. They were exclusively male-dominated panels. And 
it's taken a long time for women to exert themselves and tell us tell the men how completely wrong they've got this. <laughs> but thank goodness it's happening at long last. I think it's also just worth me saying that one other thing that's really st st struck me about all this, researching this issue, is that if you go back before the 1920s in the UK, there was just about no coronary heart disease. And that's quite staggering when you consider what happened during the 20th century. But I've got data from Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. They did not have a single case of heart attack to deal with between 1920 and 1926 when they had two cases. <laughs> And by 1930, they were getting about four cases a year, and it increased exponentially up to the 1970s when they were getting over 500 cases a year. And that happened during a time when saturated fat consumption in the diet stayed almost flat. And in fact, it was slightly falling. But what was happening is that during the, ni the 19th century, sugar consumption in the UK increased tenfold. Not by 10%, but tenfold. It went up from 10 pounds per head in 1830 to £100 per head by 1900. And ironically, just as we've been told to avoid um, vegetable animal fats, it was about this time that we started to see the inclusion of hydrogenated vegetables in the diet. And so we've, we've seen a, a situation where we've not got to grips with the rise of, of coronary heart disease. It's still the biggest killer. And in fact, if you look at all the medical inventions and developments that we've had, in fact, we've actually seen a real effective increase in coronary heart disease during a time when we've been reducing our saturated fat consumption. Now, what I want to do is just say, how can we solve this huge problem of, of fats in the diet? We've got a situation where uh, we've got an insatiable demand for vegetable oils. And we've heard today the production of these oils is linked to environmental problems, soil degradation, loss of biodiversity, overuse of water and other non-renewable resources. And it's not just in palm oil. It is also, if you take canola and soybean oil, there are huge environmental problems associated with the production of these crops. And yet we can't get enough. And you need to bear in mind that while often, in fact Jonathan Foley this morning was implying these huge greenhouse gas costs associated with livestock, and we mustn't underplay them because there are some. Actually, we are using almost all the soybean oil. And if we didn't feed the protein to livestock, all that would happen is the price of soybean oil would double. We still need it. Or if we weren't using that, we'd have to have even more palm oil, unless we can go back to animal fats. Now, as I've just said, we've switched to animal fat, uh, <coughs> vegetables. It's not actually made any difference. And as Nina and Cynthia have pointed out, What's happened is that we're, we're, we're eating a lot more omega-6 oils. And the reason the omega-6, omega-3 balance is so important is because these affect our hormones. And the hormones are vitally important in our ability to synthesize, sorry, they affect our vitamin levels. And these are vitally important in our ability to synthesize hormones. So the balance between these two types of essential fatty acids, we need some of both. But we've got the balance completely wrong. Um, and if we take the other oils just very briefly, canola oil, soy, um, rapeseed oil as we call it in the UK, it's really largely associated with the decline of pollinating insects, which is another major, major food security issue, because you get massive amounts of pollen and nectar for the bees and other insects during this time of year, the crops are in flower, and then when they've gone over, there's absolutely nothing for them to, to forage on at all. So we're starving pollinating insects and we're also poisoning them with the insecticides which these crops, which these crops require. Um, now, we've heard the case about why we should be moving back to animal fats, but we do have to be honest and recognise, as many speakers have said already in the plenary session, that plants produce oils more efficiently than animals. You actually get a lot more oil out of crops grown on an acre of land than you do as keeping animals there. And at the moment, there actually are not enough animal fats around to replace the vegetable oils. So what do we do about that, particularly when we've got the fact that livestock are responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions per pound of protein than animals? Now, what I think we have to do, first of all, is recognise the point that's been made today that we've actually been seriously misled um, by what I believe to be a conspiracy between the sugar industry and the vegetable oils industry who actually knew 50 or 60 years ago 
about these problems, just like the tobacco industry knew about the problems of smoking, and they've been determined to put the blame on something else to keep the heat off them. But then we need to carry out a comprehensive, and I mean comprehensive and unbiased, analysis of the true cost of accounts of producing food in different ways. And I don't think we should actually prejudge the outcomes of that. My, my personal hope is that it will actually reinforce the case that we've made today. But we do have to recognise that vegetable oils can produce more per area of land. But we also recognise that if, if you're getting protein and fat from animals, you can, you're effectively doubling that efficiency. And that's something which no researchers to date have actually acknowledged. They say protein from animals far less efficient than protein from crops because just look at the amount you can produce. But they forget that in a traditional system you actually get the fat free of charge from livestock. And because of the anti-saturated fat campaign, the anti-animal fat campaign, we've seen a situation whereby all the pressure has been put on livestock producers, and I'm one of them, to produce lean animals. And in the US you've got that to a greater extent than in Europe, use the seven hormone growth modes which are used to make animals so they have almost no fat on them at all. And in pig production they use a beta agonist, which is a type of hormone called ractopamine, which also makes them, the animals extremely lean. Now if you just removed those artificial stimulants you'd actually, and, and kept the animals a week or so longer, you'd actually put a huge amount more fat on them and it would be free fat. And if we take Cynthia Daly's point about producing them in a grass-fed way, grass-fed beef only accounts for about 5% of US beef at the moment. In the UK, it's significantly more than that because we've got a very pastoral country. You could actually quadruple the amount of lard you were producing for pigs within literally months. And you could double or treble the amount of tallow you were getting beef from beef animals at no real extra cost to farmers. In fact, at the moment, farmers are penalised for producing fat. If my animals get a tiny bit over fat and I need to sell one to the conventional market, I'm heavily penalised financially for, for doing that. So we need to look at degradation, the carbon and nitrogen loss from soil if you convert grassland to, to crop production, the biodiversity impacts as I've mentioned, the, whether these systems and how dependent they are on non-renewable resources. I'm not suggesting that all grass-based livestock systems are perfect at the moment, far from it. Many of them use far too much nitrogen fertiliser, they just use rye grass, they're not bringing in legumes to get fertilised nitrogen naturally, but we, if we carry out a proper analysis of these different systems, we could then come up with, a, with an understanding of which systems are really and truly the most effective, the most efficient, and the most, the most efficient cost way forward for, for society as a whole. Um, I basically made these points already, and final thing I want to just make, whether we want the future to look like like this as the way we produce our oils. This is how soybean oil is produced in South America and corn oil produced in that way, or whether we want, uh, this is a, a diagram, a pasture-based way of producing our oils in future. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, we, we have about 20 minutes for question and answer. I'm going to ask all the panelists to come forward and sit in these seats up front. I think it will really help the dialogue. And um, as everyone's coming forward, I just want to make, um, you know, my expertise is really on the environmental side. Um, I was uh, an environmental attorney for several years before I began uh, raising livestock myself and writing books. Um, and my Defending Beef book is mostly focused on the ecological questions surrounding the raising of cattle. Uh, but what's, uh, what's been I, so I, I didn't talk a lot about the environmental side because this is really talking about the food side of it. But what's been intriguing to me is how this question of the externalized costs of raising livestock is really, has got so much attention in recent years, but has been given such a poor treatment, I think, such an artificial, uh, superficial treatment. And the question of the greenhouse gas emissions from, from livestock production has gone through very dramatic shifts in terms of you know, how it's treated in the last couple of years. And finally, I think in the last year or so, the last couple of years, we've begun to see really important emerging research that shows that that question as well is far more complex. You can't, when you're talking about natural systems, you have to, you have to look at 
this issue much more holistically, and just measuring emissions is an almost meaningless way to approach the question. So it's increasingly recognized that well-managed grazing has tremendous benefits as far as the soil biology, how much carbon is sequestered, and the presence of methane oxidizing bacteria. So there's even research in Australia by Dr. Christine Jones and Dr. Mark Adams and others and research in India that is showing that well-managed cattle grazing can be carbon neutral if you have very healthy soils because there's so much oxidation of the methane from those bacteria and there's so much sequestration of the carbon. And there's even, even research showing that it's a net benefit. And in fact, the one um, sort of ecological uh, paper I want to bring to your attention is this, I happen to be carrying it around and showing it to everyone. <laughs> Um, it's a very recent paper. It's from March, April of 2016 by Dr. Richard Teague as the lead researcher and he's, and he's also um, joined in this paper by Dr. Ratan Lal, who's one of the world's leading soil scientists, and Dr. Mark Rasmussen, who's the Center for um, Aldo Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture um, director, and several others. And the title of it is The Role of Ruminants in Reducing Agriculture's Carbon Footprint in North America. And it's an extremely thoughtful and well-documented piece that are published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, a peer-reviewed paper, um, arguing that well-managed livestock on grass, ruminants on grass, are a net benefit to the greenhouse gas emissions question. So I don't want to even concede that point that you were saying, Richard, that we have to acknowledge that um, they're, they're more greenhouse gas intensive. I would say once again, it's all about how they are raised. And when we do it well, it's not at all clear that it's a net problem from a greenhouse gas perspective. And in fact, I think it's actually an opportunity. So we've had a tremendous presentations. Um, I, we welcome your questions now. We don't have as much time as we would like, but okay, Patrick, you get <laughs> the first one because your hand is up. I, I just Into you know supporting good practice 
as we do in other types of activities like crop insurance and subsidies. I mean, if we really would reward good practice, they'll go there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm confident they'll go there. But they need support. They don't need to be the talk of the coffee shop because that will be a huge detriment to this culture. They don't want to be that guy that gets talked about at the coffee shop. So if we're really going to do this well, and I think we can, it's effective demonstration, and it's really putting policy in a way that will incentivize them to do good things. And then we need to get the best farmer, the guy that everybody looks to, you know, in every neighborhood, and we need to get them on board. And once they're doing it, everybody else will look across the fence line, and they'll wonder why they're not doing it too. So it's, it's an exercise, I think it's a college more than anything. Yeah. Great. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in on this? I'm not familiar with the farming practice, so I can't speak to that. But what I can say is that we need those transformational shifts. The size of these externalities are simply unsustainable. So unless we can push that kind of change, whether it's the system that you described or others, these incremental efforts that we've been focused on the last 10 years will never get us to where we need to be. So I fully agree, it's got to be transformational. Thank you. Next question, we have here. Hi, uh, my name is Suzanne, I'm a journalist. Um, I've been working on a story about palm oil for some time. Um, you talk so much about the environmental aspects and the public health aspects in terms of food cutting and what that can do in terms of haze. Um, one part that you actually didn't address that much was the uh, role of human labor, specifically mm -hmm. slavery in the palm oil production chain, and I think that's worth addressing too. So um, when you were speaking to the 43 billion uh, in environmental um, impacts and then the, on top of the 50 billion, if we were to compensate all the workers and give them adequate conditions, the total cost would amount to even more than that. Um, furthermore, uh, I think the science that people are doing in palm oil is great, but there is a huge question of how it gets to um, not only the big producers, but the small holders. So eventually you're talking about like hundreds of billions of dollars. So my question for you is, how do you, right now all we have is the RSPO that's like, this is sustainable, but they need to be released anyway. Um, who bears that burden? What do you think are ways to work around this issue to like actually make it sustainable? Because from all the reporting I've done, it sounds like Paul Mott's here to stay. Um, okay, so let's let's yeah. give the panelists a chance to respond. Maybe Cynthia first, actually, and and then Libby. Well, actually, I'm grappling with that very question right now in in Sabah, where we've now mandated that um, in the next nine years we will produce only. Um, RSPO certified palm oil, um, and we're beginning with a smallholder component. And in fact, yesterday we had a pre-conference session um, off-site, and today, again, I continued this discussion about how do we finance that transformation, um, particularly with smallholders. Uh, I don't think anyone has any answers. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take all of us to grapple with this, this financing mechanism that doesn't yet exist, it seems. Um, in fact, just today over, over lunch with Pavan Sutte, we were talking about bonds um, to help small, the small holders make the transition. But that means, you know, the, the West and the North coming into, into, into the, the equation with us. Um, because we in Malaysia and Indonesia cannot make those transformations ourselves. Um, the aid agencies and the World Bank and IFC are, are funding, financing business as usual. Libby, did you want to add something? Well, I think it's a great point that you bring up about the social costs. Uh, TEEP did look at two social metrics, uh, fair wages and uh, appropriate labor, and then the worker health and safety. So if we were to add those externalities into the number that's an additional $34 per ton. So again, significant, but a small piece. And I think part of what you raise is the challenge with many of these solutions that you've got some large growers, a little more alike, but then hundreds if not thousands of small growers. And I agree that it's the capital markets that we need to bring into the conversation. So you have large institutional asset owners who are looking to fund more sustainable agricultural investments, take their um, investments out of 
uh, oil, petroleum, and the like, they need to invest in something that is low carbon, carbon efficient. So we need to get the capital markets in the room as part of this conversation and help them understand how to direct their capital towards more sustainable palm oil production. And I think, um, I think you made the comment that palm oil is here to stay, and I think that's probably true. It's hard to reverse what's already been done. But I think part of the goal of this session is to raise the general awareness about the ecological and social consequences of making this shift away from animal fats and towards, and as Nina pointed out, there's a reason why that specific fat is really desirable for replacing animal fats. So, um, especially now that we've kind of gotten rid of trans fats because it's basically illegal to use them anymore in the United States. So, so you have to have particular types of fats, and palm oil kind of really fits the bill. But if we unwind this, you know, sort of orthodoxy that animal fats are bad for us, I think it really helps us make the case that they belong in our diet, in our baked goods, in our cooking, etc. And we don't need to keep expanding. I mean, I think the projected size of the industry, I can't remember if you said it, Libby, it's, it's, it, the, the projected growth line for the palm oil is, is, is unbelievable. But we can affect that projection by, you know, what happens after we leave the room here. I think well, that. I just want to say, you know, I, part, part of my research involved talking to tons of food industry executives. And they, you know, they needed some kind of hard fat. And they, if they could go, they can't use lard and tallow because the, because the government says that it has this 10% cap on saturated fats and because those fats are, are considered just that. People won't buy those goods. If you can reverse that, that, which seems to be based on no science, you will instantly reduce demand for palm oil. Palm oil, the only reason that curve went goes way up is that uh, they need a hard fat. But they would use lard and tallow, which are locally produced. You can raise them on animals for free. All you have to do is not give them hormones, and they grow fatter. And then you have that fat. So that would instantly reduce demand for palm oil. It's the most efficient thing you could do. So the, the reduction for the demand is, I think, feasible, but it requires a massive shift in thinking and, and approaches. To it. But I don't think it's out of the question. It's not totally unrealistic. Now, there are a bunch of hands yeah, up. I, I don't know whose hand has been up longer. I'll start on the U.S. producers are all okay. engaged. Um, so I was curious where you think this attitude shift comes from. Because I thought one of, one of the things that were very fascinating to me was like this attitude came from a nutritionist who kind of set the national tone and attitude towards um, saturated fat. And then even like when I was taking class on um, on nutrition at Stanford, the nutritionist himself, like the nutrition professor, was going through his own transformation of his ideas. Like he didn't he no longer vilified cholesterol. But he like saturated fat does lead to cholesterol, you know, rise. So and then in my dealings with nutritionists through my job, I realized that's still their thinking. Like it's it's so ingrained. And if you're saying people's jobs are at stake, you know, their accreditation and stuff like. Where, who can stand out and say something about it at this point? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this question is definitely for Nina, unless you had someone else you wanted to respond oh, to. No. I mean, she's been really facing a lot of opposition for her message. I'll let her tell you more about that. But there's no doubt that, they, that it's very deeply ingrained and that people are really wedded to the idea because they've been teaching their students that for three decades and they don't want to you know, think that they've been doing something very, very wrong in their teaching. I mean, I think it's just human nature. But, what would you yeah, say? I mean, it's that. just, it's a huge paradigm shift that has to happen to reflect the science. Um, and there, it's just a huge subject. I mean, I, I, there's a fledgling group that, group that I started in, in Washington, D.C. called the Nutrition Coalition, which gathers together scientists and doctors and you know, people to try to bring a different message and, and actually change our government's policy on this issue. Just because it's, it's just been captured by, you know, the USDA has been captured by industry and it's going to be a long, long time um, to change the mess, you know, until it gets out to the masses. I mean, it's just a huge undertaking. And, and I have, as Nicola does so much, I mean, I've really been out there as a, as a talking about the science and how it's changing. And I have, I have, you can Google me and see the kind of abuse <laughs> I've gotten. I got disinvited from a national food policy panel then. There was a petition that was started, and 4,300 people signed the petition to get me reinstated. And then, I mean, it's just crazy. And if you read this article by Ian Leslie in The Guardian, I mean, you will see, like, it is crazy, the, the name calling that is going on. And it's, it's, the politics of it are insane and very pitched right now. And but what's so frightening is to imagine that that's, happening, that that's what's determining what kind of advice we're getting as far as our dietary recommendations, right? So yeah. 
it is important to understand the political aspects of this, which I think are significant. But I think we, we really have to challenge this orthodoxy. I think that you know, Nina and others have done a great job of showing that it, it's basically a house of cards that has collapsed. And so, okay, now what? So we reevaluate things. And, and I think, it, does anybody else want to add on this point? Well, if I could, you know, because we talked about the paradigm shift in agriculture that needs to happen. And, and you're talking about the paradigm shift that needs to happen with the health recommendations coming from our nutritionists, our medical doctors, and so on. It's really a human factor issue. I mean, it's, we can't get out of our own way. But the advice has to be right from the top down. Like right now, it's wrong. Everything flows from the official government dietary guidelines, and that has to be fixed. And then everything kind of flows from there, all the professional recommendations of all the professional societies. So the advice has to be right at the top, because so much flows from that. Let's get a couple more questions, because unless, Richard, did you have a burning point? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, I think, you know, that's just how, I'm normally a pessimist in the, in the sustainable future, but I do have to feel <laughs> that we are possibly actually just about to face a real shift in attitudes here, because there's something rather sort of um, herd instinct amongst journalists, and while they all were pushing the, 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 the case, and it's that really best case for a very long time, there is just now a move of a change, because the evidence is starting to go forward. I just have to just tell you, there's a, there's a campaign that you've now retired called Jeanette Longfield in the UK, a friend of mine, so we've worked together on the antivirus campaign very closely. But we've long had a different opinion about saturated fat, and she, in fact, more has made a living promoting the anti saturated fat campaign. And we were together at a reception about two years ago, and she said, What do you think the one most important thing we could do is to um, improve the health of the nation? And she just taken the last sip of red wine at that point. And I said, eat more saturated fat. <laughs> she, she had a great deal of difficulty not spitting out what they had. <laughs> but maybe by today, her views have already shifted a little bit. Or <laughs> <laughs> she's drinking a lot more We've wine. We've got several more hands up and only a few more minutes, so let's get yes, well, I'm curious, uh, Nina, Cynthia, um, you know, earlier in the plenaries, we've heard a lot about the need to shift towards a more plant based diet. Protein consumption hasn't changed significantly in the last. It's, it's remained pretty much constant. Um, so I know there was a there's been some reporting on that, but I don't think it reflects the actual data about a plant-based diet. That is a big topic. Um, clearly, a grain-based diet is not is a high carbohydrate diet, and for people, some people can tolerate it, but for the majority of people now who are basically insulin resistance, which is manifested through diabetes or obesity, those people cannot handle, they cannot handle that level of carbohydrates. So, um, so they must reduce their grains and, and um, you know, and starchy vegetables and, some, you know, for some people if you're diabetic you can't even have that much fruit. So, there needs to be some flexibility in uh, our recommendations for people. Not everybody can eat a plant-based, grain-based, high-carbohydrate diet. That is very, very clear now. Um, and so the plant-based diet movement is complex, um, and it is, but I will tell you that it is not, the fundamental thing I would say is it's not based on, on rigorous science. There has never been a clinical trial of a vegetarian diet um, ever. So it's mainly based on weak epidemiological evidence, um, and that's a problem. So the whole China study thing that's been so popular, right? The China study is an epidemiological study that shows association, not causation. So the clinical trials, again, what can show causation, shows that diets that are um, lower in carbohydrates and more fat are produce far better, greater benefits in terms of weight loss, blood glucose control for diabetes, and most of your cardiovascular risk factors. So and that's I'll, just, I'll that's just, add, just and I'm going to cut you off here because I know you can talk about this for a long time. I have other questions, but I just, I just want to add to that that um, I was really surprised when I began <gasps> examining the, you know, the USDA data and all the research for, over the last, you know, 30 years in particular, but especially over the last century, um, how our diet has actually shifted. And I was very, very surprised to learn um, that, you know, we have actually increased our fruit and vegetable consumption quite a bit over the last 30 years. We have 
uh, reduced quite dramatically our red meat consumption. We've reduced, we saw about the fats here today, but we've reduced not just our animal fats, but our overall red meat consumption quite dramatically. We've increased uh, chicken, turkey, and fish. So again, we've sort of followed the dietary recommendations <laughs> right. on that very issue, and we have the current state of affairs. So to me, that's a, a large part of the answer to the question, which is to me that shifting towards more plants and away from away from red meats is, is not leading to better health, health outcomes. I mean, there's obviously tons of research on this question as far as mortality and morbidity and all this, and I review a lot of it in Defending Beef, actually. But my own feeling is that there is, uh, there is a lack of, as you said, you know, of science showing that that's better for long-term health. Um, so I want to answer some other questions. You had a hand up. I'm not sure if I was just thinking about it as a consumer, that the conversation that people are having for, have for the past decade has been about low-fat diets. All right, so I think there's a language uh, issue here. If, if fat is healthy for people, how much should they have, regardless of what, where the source is from? There's a whole misunderstanding about the role of fats and neurological health and so on. Any of you like to talk about that evolution of language? Can I just say one quick thing before we go to the panel? Um, I think even the more conservative um, elements within the sort of better food and better nutrition movement are embracing the notion that that was a total, that, that was very misdirected. That, in other words, um, while the, there are not that many people yet embracing <coughs> Um, the shift on the saturated fat or animal fats question, um, the, the idea that low fat is good, I think is it has really fallen out of favor. So I, I don't think that there's that much support for that anymore, although there's still some. <laughs> but wait, Richard, and then Nina. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and I don't, I don't think anybody knows the exact answer to that question. A lot of them depend on your own personal metabolism, how much diet exercise you have. If you go back to the 1980s, when people, when we were told to eat their saturated fat, average energy consumption per person in the UK, and I guess it was pretty similar in the US, was 41% of our dietary energy came from fat. Today that's down to 35%, of which about 10% comes from saturated fats. Now, we also need to remember that sugar and, and, and refined carbohydrates turn into fat in our bloodstream. And that's what most people don't realize. If you have, it's very easy to overeat on, on, on sugar-based foods. Even white rice, for example, will put too much fat in your bloodstream because your liver can only absorb a certain amount and the triglycerides flow over into your, into your bloodstream. Um, I think that, that I would say that the one thing we can benefit about with fat is that fat, fat, eating too much of anything is obviously harmful. But, and fat that should, Nicolette said right at the beginning, fat and sugar together, for example, in a donut is a, is a recipe for disaster because uh, you get the worst of both worlds. But the one thing about fat is that in, in modern diets, most of that fat is hidden because we move, if you take a rump steak, for example, you see a piece of fat around the outside, and we're now told to cut that off. But we're eating because we actually have a need for fat. And if you don't have enough fat in your diet, you feel hungry at the end of a meal and you go and move for some chocolate biscuits or something like that. And that that's a recipe for disaster. But if you can see the fat, which you actually can with, 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 with meat in, in, in general, uh, and actually consume that. The, the, but the problem is, it's all this palm oil. You don't see palm oil in food like you would see a piece of fat on meat. It's all hidden in the food. So I would say that we should just eat what we need to eat for our, to feel comfortable. And if we actually recognize that eating the, the visible fats rather than eating hidden, hidden fats, we probably won't go too far wrong. Yeah, we didn't talk really about processed foods versus real whole foods. And I think that is a very important aspect of this question. I think we're out of time. And so I just want to. Uh, Thank, it's been, I think, a fabulous discussion. Thank you to the panelists. <laughs>